Last time when I talked, I did uh, walking in creativity. And so a number of you uh, had questions about, like with kids, uh, what would this work? So we, we went out and tried to follow up on one of the questions. We had uh, ha the kids sit in a chair that swiveled so they could fidget, or they had to sit perfectly still. And the answer is, if you fidget, you're more creative. But it doesn't improve your memory for anything. So, okay, but today, today I want to talk about something very different. Uh, this is more about learning. It's probably more directly relevant to your practice. And so, so something that people often don't realize that you, is that you learn to see the world. We, we kind of see it in front of us, and it's hard to believe there's something else to be seen. So this, I'm going to talk a little about perceptual learning. We'll see if this works. The audio is kind of goofy. Um, the... I think... <laughs> so I think that the, um, the quarterback ran the ball through the middle. But I'm not sure if that was Okay, the defensive team jumped off sides. They were doing a blitz, and the quarterback gave it to one of his running backs, and he broke a couple tackles, and he's on his way to try and score a touchdown. So it turns out the second woman ended up marrying a professional basketball player. So she, she really was into sports. But the first one could not see it. Right, they, she just couldn't see it. And so it's sort of stunning that it's right in front of them and they can't see it. Uh, here's an example where you've learned to perceive. So I'll, I'll start you with this one. And you can look at this for a few seconds. Right, so this is, here's one where you probably haven't learned to perceive. This is the one where you have. So this is the analog, right? So in one case, you can see the structure. In the other case, you can't. I still haven't quite figured out how that one right there is an A. Uh, I'm sure somehow it, it's in there. So uh, one great thing about this, this thing is it's an awesome assessment. So what people uh, notice reveals. So a great assessment is you show students a relevant image for about 15 seconds. Uh, you wait a minute, and then you ask them to redraw the image from memory. And you'll see what it is they've noticed. Uh, and so. I'm, I'm going to show that to you in a second. I'm going to present a study where we use that. But for now, just to give you an idea, if I have you look at this, right, and then I wait, and then I ask you to recreate it, uh, you're probably going to draw buildings wiped out, things like that. The, a geologist absolutely would remember that the road is undercutting the cliff, and that's the cause of the uh, landslide. And so you can see these things in drawings when people redo it. So uh, expertise, we often think of experts as having a great deal of abstract knowledge. You know, you this image of Einstein with an equation in his head or something. Uh, they also have very precise perception, right? So your radiologist, I don't know if you've ever gotten your knee scoped or you've seen an MRI. You look at it, you can't see anything. And the radiologist can see very precise things, right, in it. Uh, kindergarten teachers, another good example. I remember one kindergarten teacher brought me in the classroom and asked me what I noticed. And I was like, well, that's a bunch of kids. Uh, you know, there you go. She said, no, you see that chair that's next to the door? When the bell rings, the kids are going to pile up on that chair, and I'm going to have some conflict in the class. And she could see this. I'd, I'd never even noticed it. Uh, if you've ever bought a house uh, and you walk around with a realtor, the things they notice is pretty amazing, or like a used car. Like I remember, bought this used car, and I asked the guy why it was being sold. He said, well, it breaks down a lot. And all I saw was cool radio. That's got a nice stereo, you know, so. So novices see basic categories. Experts see precise categories. So uh, I'm going to show a picture, and you decide what it is. Ready? Anybody? Anybody? BMW SUV. BMW SUV. That's pretty precise. 2014 X5. Don't don't be culturally biased. You know. 
So this is a 2007 BMW X5, right? So now you understand the game, Let, let's do it again. Blue bird, blue bird. Indigo bunting, good. Halfway there. It's, it's an indigo bunting, it's a male indigo bunting. <laughs> So here, here's one where you will, you will have expertise. So notice you don't say human, right? You're very, very precise about this. So, uh, so if you have expertise, you see more specific things, more specific categories. If you're a novice, you just sort of see enough to get by, right? Uh, so the challenge here is you always see something. There, there's, there's no situation you walk into where it doesn't make sense visually. And it fools you to think you see everything there is to be seen, right? And the way it usually works is these basic categories are sufficient for everyday life. So we can get by by seeing that a penny is different from a nickel, a dime, a quarter. And we never bother to see things more precisely. So let me just give you an example. Which of these is the correct image of a penny? Nobody has a penny? I don't know the answer. Somebody must have a penny. So. I, I think it's L, but I'm not sure. OK. It's not L? We're, we're going to get the answer soon. I like your confidence. <laughs> well, they've got a penny. I got a penny. Wait, you got a penny? It's A? It's A? It's G. Okay. Okay. So this is your homework. Uh, <laughs> it's A? Okay. So uh, it. Clearly, you've handled pennies all your life, right? And, but you never bothered to see what makes a penny, except enough to notice it's different from a nickel, right? And so these everyday categories, sort of how we organize our world. Uh, in school, we want them to notice things they haven't seen before, right? We want to develop their ability to perceive the world. And the students will think they've seen everything. And it's, so it's hard, you know, unless you show, like, uh, a dinosaur, which is, you know, inconceivable if you've never seen a dinosaur. But, but for most things, it's very precise, subtle. So how can you help people learn to perceive? Uh, well, uh, if you were to give me this glass of wine and have me taste it, I would go, yes, that's very red, <laughs> right? And so the, the way you solve that problem is you give contrasting cases, right? You allow people to taste things that are quite close, and so you can find that signal that makes it different. Uh, and so part of the challenge with seeing is that uh, a, a single instance to see actually contains about an infinite amount of information. So we'll, we'll play another little game here. Uh, so uh, I will set up a contrast, and you decide what the figure on the left is. Good job. I can see, I can see why you're hollyhock material. It's good. Okay. Big-ish. Solid. Yes, on the left side of the screen. So, so this, this, game, this game can go on forever, right? It's a circle that's being shown in this building on this day in this universe. So that's the challenge, right? Any single thing can be many things. So like uh, if you're, uh, I have a young child and I point to a can of Coke that's half filled and I say to the child, Coke. The child's task is to figure out, do I mean the can? Do I mean the liquid inside? Do I mean that it's half full? Do I mean that it's on the table? 
right? And this, this is the child's task, is to figure out which of the infinite possibilities my uh, sense of definition is referring to. So these contrasts help. You notice how each contrast helped highlight a different feature. So here, here's a, a crazy study we did way back. Uh, we, we were trying to teach people to recognize dogs. And so we could either show them an exact, just a single dog, so this is the dog, the breed, or we could do it in contrasting cases where the dog was put next to a set of near misses. And we want to see which helped people learn better. And to find out, we then gave them a lineup of seven dogs, and they had to choose which one was the same breed. Yeah, it's a very hard task. Uh, so the answer is this one. Yeah, and so as you, we brought in dog experts to help run the study. I'll explain that in a second. It turns out it's the, they look at the separation of the ears is the key, not the hair. Yeah, how about that? So, uh, so what we did is we, we, had, we brought people in, and they could either study the single dog or they'd get the dog with a set of contrasts next to it. And so they'd either get a single ex exemplar or contrasting dogs. And then for half of them, we had an expert trying to tell them how to recognize the dog. Right, so they, we, we brought in these experts who it turned out these experts were from like, uh, where they, they're show dogs. And I, unbeknownst to me, I picked all working dogs. So the experts weren't super experts, but they, they were much better than, than you or I. So then afterwards, we want to see the, the, the students who do this. They come back, and then they have to do this task on the bottom. And we see how many dogs they pick before they pick the right one. Right? So a lower number is better. So uh, if you just got the exemplar, having the expert trying to explain it to you didn't help at all. Right? And, and the reason for this is that the expert would say, well, notice the curvature of its nose and you have no idea what they're talking about, right? It's like, yeah, it's curved, great. When they got contrast, then the experts could help, right? Because uh, they could say, no, it's not like this one, it's like this one. Uh, if you didn't have the expert, you got overwhelmed. There were too many dogs, you couldn't, it was too hard of a contrast to do on your own. So, uh, so this is a basic truth about learning uh, learning to perceive, but learning in general. It's, it's often learning to distinguish one thing from another. And so uh, if you wanted to teach Japanese speakers to hear L, right, a bad solution is to go L, L, L. They can't hear it, right? And you just keep saying it over and over and over. The, the, the right solution is to make a really big contrast. You go R, L, and so they can begin to isolate the difference. And then you bring the contrast down and down and down and down. And so then they can make the subtle distinctions you hear in speech. So uh, you need these contrasts to help properties of importance. So this is a, a very simple tip that people forget. They forget the importance of showing negative instances. We, always, we like to only show positive instances. So here's a quick example. Uh, we're trying to have people learn polygons. And so uh, over on the right side, are just all examples of polygons. And so we let them study these for some amount of time. So that's one group. The other group, we give them the examples, and I don't know if you can see them, we also give them a bunch of non-examples, things that aren't polygons. And then we say, what are the properties of polygons based on their sort of observation of these? And so there's three things we're looking for. It's a closed figure, straight lines, lines do not cross. So this, uh, and then we, we coded, you know, did they mention one, two, three, zero of these properties? So what you find is a pretest, people don't seem to know the properties of polygons. Uh, at at post-test, you find that the people who got the examples and non-examples are sort of doubling the other one, right? So this is, this is a simple thing in instruction. Give negative cases, say, it's this, it's not that, right? It's just a simple tip. Okay, so now, given the importance of this, what is a guaranteed way to ruin it when you're teaching? And the answer is telling too soon. And so I'm gonna prove this to you. Uh, so 
A very typical model of instruction is sort of tell and practice. The students are told what to do or think, and then you, you know, they might get a lecture or a worked example or written instructions. So they get that first, right? And then afterwards, you give them a bunch of problems to solve based on what you just told them. Sound familiar? Sound like college? Yeah, yeah. So the, the problem with this is that uh, students focus on what they were told. They're paying attention to what you just told them. They're not paying attention to the situation. So they're not going to see anything new because they're so busy trying to copy what you told them. And so telling people can overshadow your, their perceptions. A good example of this uh, is there's this great study where there's this toy that has like four functions to it. And if the parent shows one of the functions to the toy of the toy and then gives it to the kid, the kid only does that. If the parent shows nothing and gives it to the kid, the kid finds all four functions of the toy, right? So they, they believe that what we're being told is everything they need to know and they just pay attention to that. So when you tell people first, they're focusing on the procedures which blocks them from seeing what is new. And so I'm gonna prove this to you. So we did this with eighth grade physics. One of, one of my joys every year is I get to go out and take over a school and teach all their science classes or something. I'm, I'm, I've, I've gotten a little old, my patience for this has dropped a little bit, so we did a bunch of fourth graders, and in the middle of it, I found myself going, sit down, and, and I realized maybe, maybe my day in the classroom is ending, but, but, but I enjoyed it. Uh, so what do density, speed, and force have in common? I only want the uh, English language arts to work on this. That's, uh, so they, what they have in common is that they're all a ratio, right? They're, they're all based in ratio. And so in middle school, ratio is the big idea in math and science, right? Algebra is just nothing but ratio, right? So uh, we provided a few days of instruction focused on ratio. This is a big idea. If they get it, it's going to carry them forward through a lot of stuff. And uh, so the way the study worked is the topic was uh, speed and density. They both involve ratio. And we had about 120 kids. And we, we split them into two groups. One group got tell and practice. And then one got Dan's secret sauce instruction, which is uh, basically called invention, inventing to learn. And uh, the study went for 28 days, but we were only in there for four uh, because we generally only get to come in on Friday because that's sort of everybody's tired. Let, let the college guy do it. So. Uh, <laughs> and so it was, it was a very prototypical thing. We had kids work in small groups to work on problems. There would be sort of class level discussion. And then the assessments were done you know, individually in test mode. So here they received these uh, high-end contrasting cases that were designed to help them learn the structure ratio. So the story here is each box is a different company, and companies ship clowns. You might ship your clowns to a party, and uh, they always crowd their clown. A company always crowds its clowns by the same amount, right? And so you want to know how much a company crowds its clowns because crowded clowns are grumpy clowns, right? And so... Uh, so that's sort of the cover story. And so here you can see that uh, these two, within a company, they have the same ratio. This is one clown to one compartment, right? And then we've set it up so that there's three separate ratios, right? But they're all a ratio. So each, so it's a very clever, tricky contrasting case because each one is different because it's different ratio, but they're all ratios, right? And so we want them to understand that, yeah, the thing that you care about is the ratio itself, not the number of people, not the number of compartments, not a single ratio, but the property of ratio. And as ratio changes, density changes. And then we put in things to sort of catch kids on common mistakes, right? So oftentimes they'll say, oh, it's two, because they confuse density with mass. So we put in that, this sort of thing where they say two for the first one, they go to the last one, they go, well, that can't be two as well because it's in a tighter space. Okay, so the tell and practice group, 
they get a standard, fairly standard description. Density is how much stuff is packed into a space. Get an example, they get the equation, right? Then they, down here, they get a worked example that shows how you would figure density out, right? And then they get the worksheet and they have to figure it out for the crowded clowns. The other group uh, gets a different story. They're told you have to compute an index. They're, we explain what an index is, like miles per gallon. Uh, they hear the story, and then they have to invent a crowdedness index to compare the companies. So we don't use the word density. They got to come up with their own solution. So both of them get that, and then they receive this thing. And they ha in one case, the students are practicing density. In the other case, they're trying to come up with their own formula for trying to compute an index of crowdedness. Make sense so far? 24 hours later, we asked the students to redraw the worksheet. And we coded their drawings to see if they noticed ratios. So we looked at, uh, would they put two buses that had the same ratio in, the se in a box, right? And so you could do that three times. So the max score there is three, the bottom score is zero. Right. And then for other reasons, we put in all this silly stuff with like clowns juggling and dotted lines because we wanted to see would they remember these, these superficial details as well. And that, that was more for a theoretical question. So here's an example of a drawing that has uh, very high structure and high surface features. So it's high structure because it captures the right ratios, right? Both of them are two clowns per compartment. And it's got a lot of surface features, like it's got the clown juggling in there, if you can see, and mm -hmm. clowns standing on the boundaries between the buses. Here's low structure and low surface. So this, this student never saw ratio. Right. They see, in one case, it's one clown per compartment. In the other one, it's two clowns per three compartments. So they just never saw the ratios. So here's what it looks like. Uh, the percent of the little surface features, like the dotted lines, remember, are about the same for the two groups. The big difference shows up on who noticed ratio. So about half the kids in the tell and practice notice ratio were three-fourths of the kids in the invent noticed it. Right? So when I tell them how to do it, they just didn't see it. Right? And that's the risk. So this study continued on. We had tell and practice versus invent. They did popcorn poppers, which looked like this. They had to come up with an index for the speed at which different poppers pop popcorn. Uh, then they did something on metal purity, which was density, and something on car movement, which was speed. And then we gave everybody a lecture on ratio. We sit straight out said, this is ratio. This is what it's good for. This is why it's in science. This is the formula. This is how you use it for the problems you solved. And then they got to practice. They got some word problems and some equations. So they got to practice. So it's pretty elaborate instruction, right? Uh, both groups learned to do well on computations to solve word problems. So I won't bother to show you those, but you can see the two groups look the same, right? So in their abilities to just, if you tell them, here's density, go compute an answer, they could do it, right? So that's the usual measure, but that's not the interesting measure. Right? That's not a good way to measure understanding. That's a good way to measure whether people have learned to copy what you told them. Right? So here's what we did. We added this. Three weeks later, we gave them this problem where they had to determine the stiffness of matte fabric. And so I'll give you a second to look at that. Those rungs allow you to count how far it's sagged down, and the people are sort of like masses on it. Right, so a very common solution is to just count the number of people. Another common solution is just to count the number of rungs, right, to determine how stretchy the fabric is. The correct answer is to do number of people divided by number of rungs, or number of rungs divided by people. So it's a ratio. So we wanted to see, would the kids recognize that they should apply a ratio to a problem like this? So this is what you find. Uh, about 12% of the students in tell and practice thought to use ratio, whereas 50% of the students in the other instruction had learned to see ratios in the world. So this is a fourfold difference. It's big. 
for these kinds of studies, you don't want people to hit 100%. Because if they hit 100%, there's no room to move. So it makes for a bad study. You really aim for tasks where people will be about 50%. And that way, the bad condition can drop down and the good condition can rise above. So these are hard tasks. So a summary, uh, the telepractice students didn't learn to see ratio. They only copied the process of using division. And so given a new recognition, a new situation, they could not recognize the importance of ratio. Uh, the invent condition was a form of discovery learning, except the students didn't actually need to discover the answer. That wasn't the goal. The goal was for them to learn to see the ratio structure. That's the hard part. The formula is easy. It's just division. The hard part is seeing the ratio. So there's a mop-up concern. Uh, many people believe discovery only works for high-achieving students. And low-achieving students should be told what to do and think. This is very typical, right? Oh, no, he's, he's, he's low-achieving. He should be in a class where he gets much more guidance and instruction. Right? It's a very common misconception. But to address that, what we did is here's the, uh, the drawings of the clowns, how much they got the ratio of the buses. And so here, what we did is we split the kids into the high and low achievement in science. And so you can see that the low achieving kids in the invention condition are matching the level of the high achieving students in the traditional instruction. Right? So it's not the case that low achieving students should be given more guidance. Right? You can see just how low they are if they get the usual instruction. On the transfer problem with the trampolines, we see the same thing. that uh, low achieving children given a chance and good structure for learning what to see, do quite well. They match the high achieving children in standard instruction. So uh, concluding thoughts, uh, we forget that a major goal of instruction is to educate perception, to help people see the world better. It's not just symbols. Uh, a risk of a lot of current instruction is that it inadvertently interferes with perceiving. It shortcuts the need to do it. And we seem to forget that if people can't perceive a situation, then they can't apply their knowledge because they won't recognize what knowledge is relevant if they can't see the details. So there are a lot of different forms of learning. Perceptual learning is one. Reinforcement learning, you know, rewards is another and has a very characteristic profile for what students will do and think. Observational is another kind of learning, right? There's all sorts. So uh, hopefully this, this will be done by the next time you visit. I have to do a little self-promotion here. Uh, it's, you know, I'm, I'm, nobody's paying me to present, so you know. <laughs> so we're, we're uh, working on this that talks about these things, and these are the different chapters, and uh, I'm done. Thank you. I work in STEM generally just because I know it. I was terrible at history. You know, it'd, it'd be bad for me to. Uh, but yeah, you can do the same thing. So I think like Sam Weinberg's thinking like a historian. You know, when you're sourcing two documents, they're two different points of view, it's a contrasting case, right? Yeah, I, I think uh, with sentence starters, you can do the same thing. You know, here are two different sentences. What do you notice about how they differ? How does it make you feel? Things like that. So, but, but. My shop is not doing that. We're, we're math science people. Because that's where the federal money comes. <laughs> and I'm no fool. But, uh, but yeah, I, th I think you can do this in a lot. I mean, uh, uh, it, it's a general truth, right? I mean, it works at the level of hearing, tasting, words, everything, to do these contrasts. So, so I like to do, I, I generally use these kinds of things. I've done it in psych classes where the theories aren't quite you know, mathematical. Uh, what I do is I give them a data set from a classic study and I ask them to graph the interesting patterns that they find in it. I don't tell them what patterns they are. Experiments are contrasting cases, right? They're sort of perfectly designed. They do that, they come up with a few things, and then I just give a lecture that delivers sort of, here's what this experiment showed, here's the theory behind it, and I get big bumps in performance, right? So a lot of these inventing tasks are to prepare students to, they're to create a time for telling. So I can imagine doing this in uh, history, 
You know, you have people do these things. They're trying to come up with their own theory for how this happened, and then they share it, and then you might afterwards sort of deliver. Here's the way some historians think about this. English and poetry, certainly, you know. So the, the trick, though, is you can't just put the contrast in front of them and say, here, look, right? You need to give them the task, right? And so that, that's the part you want to think about, is, is the task for them to decide why this painting is better than this forgery, for example. So you take a, an original and a forgery, put them side by side. And then they, they have that task, and they've worked on it. They've noticed lots of stuff. Then when you explain afterwards, they're ready for it. They understand the distinctions you're making. Thank you. Uh, you could do that. If, 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 there, if there's some concern that uh, students have a lot of bugs in their thinking, you might show sort of good and bad. Uh, a version I've seen, say, for algebra is that it'll show two ways to solve the same problem side by side. And, and then the students, what you find is later they'll show more flexibility on algebra problems. If you put them like this, far apart, they won't because it never occurs to them that they should be relating these back and forth. But if they're side by side, it works. Uh, in statistics, uh, I do this a lot. So I teach the intro PhD course in statistics and I do this kind of game with the whole thing. Let me see if I can find a, a quick one to give you an idea of sort of how So what, what these are is I tell them these are the results of different pitching machines. And each ball represents where a pitch landed when it was aiming for the target. Right? And their job is to come up with a reliability measure for each of the machines using the same method. Uh, and this is important because if you're a young kid, you want a very reliable pitching machine. Right? But if you're a you know, major leaguer, you, you want erratic. And so the students sort of come up with different ways to try and figure this out. You know, you get people who measure, write a, do a box around the whole thing. And then the contrasts are kind of evil. So if you sort of notice, uh, I don't get a point over this. If you notice the bottom left and the uh, top left, it's exactly the same shape, but it's just more pitches, right? Should that change your reliability index or not? Right, and so the students go through this, and then afterwards, I just give the straight up lecture on the standard, on, on variance. So there's lot, lots of ways to do it. Uh, generally, the more you can retreat from a symbolic presentation of a problem, the more the students can jump in and find features. For the polygons, the negative instances are really helpful, right, because yeah. you, you, looking at examples, you're not gonna think curve. It just doesn't occur to you that I should have been asking whether it's a curve. So there the negative examples are good. Generally defining categories, that's useful. Uh, but you know, showing mistakes isn't this, you don't, you, what you need to do is highlight the thing you want them to notice, right? And so here, what I want them to notice is that there's those two buses on the top, I've told them they're the same crowdedness. And that crowdedness differs from the bus below it, right? So that's the contrast. Oh, okay. But at the same time, I made it so that all of them partake of ratio. So that's why this, I call this sort of a high-end thing. Mm -hmm. So these are called uh, perceptual learning modules. They've been doing these things a lot in uh, LA, I think, out of UCLA. Uh, so what students get is they'll get a graph, and then they get these three equations underneath, and they have to pick which one is right, right? And so it's these, these the, you'll notice if you look at the choices below, they all use the same numbers. Oh, okay. What? <laughs> so you notice how the hay bales foreshorten into the distance? <laughs> uh, okay. Anyway, so, so a good place for this is uh, like linear, monotonic, right? Uh, all these different curves and things like that. And we assume that students see what we see and they don't. And so if you explicitly help them contrast, right, instead of just let's all do linear, now let's all do curvilinear, that means when they were doing linear, they didn't know it was linear because they didn't know there was this other thing, curvilinear. So you can put those things next to each other, uh, certainly contrasting cases where the negative sign is and things like that. So the trick is to say, what is the feature I want them to notice and then make the contrast on that.
So generally, we've trained our students with the problems we give them to treat each one separately. So we've sort of found this, you know, college physics here, that you give students a series of problems and they're all kind of the same problem and they'll give, treat them all separately. And so this is the problem with this sort of sequential ordering. It's also, you know, if it's front back, I don't see it. I flip to the back side. Well, I don't remember what I don't see, so I can't make the contrast. So you put them side by side, it sort of breaks them out of their usual mold, and you tell them, compare these two things with respect to this question, and, and it helps. You need to coax them a little bit, uh, because it's, it's sort of a task they've never done, right? And so you sort of help them go through the first one. You keep saying, well, would it work for this one? Does that really make sense? and you sort of help them through it. Once they've done it once and they're in the game, it works pretty well. But the first time, you gotta sort of help them. Having, having groups is better because one, one person will notice one thing and the other person will notice another and then eventually they'll have to reconcile one another. Individuals will sort of say, I don't know, I, I don't know, I quit, yeah. Uh, so a little bit of coaxing, doesn't take a lot. You know, it's sort of a fun game. When, looking for patterns is fun. Uh, so, if I wanted these students to hit 100%, I would have taught them the way I would normally teach, which is I would then pick off the students who I feel need more attention. But this is a research study, and so you want to sort of stay away from that. You don't want people to hit ceiling. It's sort of designed that way. But if it was a classroom and there's a bunch of kids who didn't get it, I would be very direct with them, you know, depending on you know, how much time I've got and things like that. So that, that's, this is always a tension point, though, is that in research, you sort of don't want people to get 100% and you don't do everything you can to help them. So you can keep that contrast, that experimental comparison clean. <laughs>